So it is the second Sunday in January, which, you know, it's my birthday's in January, and it's, it's always kind of that second week is just kind of a, a letdown, right? Because it's like you had you know, Halloween and Thanksgiving and Christmas, and there's so much opportunity to get together, to celebrate good food, good fellowship, all these great opportunities. And, you know, and then after my birthday, what else is there? Right, and and so it's like, and I'm sure that you all felt the same way after my birthday passed. Um, just so, to, and it's like, yeah, you find yourself taking down the decorations, and it's there's so much less joy taking the decorations down than putting them up, you know. And it's for that reason that I still have a Christmas tree up. It's not, you know, just putting it off for later. It's just there's just it's kind of a downer. And I guess this morning. As a way of introduction, I want to encourage you by reminding you that 2022 is going to have holidays. It's going to have celebrations. In fact, just around the corner will be, I think, maybe one of the best celebrations. Um, And it it certainly, I don't know if it's the best celebration, but it definitely has maybe the best holiday-themed movie. Um, Far better than anything you'll ever get on the Hallmark Channel or or any other channel. I would say that the best holiday-themed movie is... Groundhog Day. Absolutely. And if and in keeping with the theme of Groundhog Day, I'll say it again, Groundhog Day, right? It, it's such a, I love that movie so much. In fact, I look forward to Groundhog Day because it is the one day of the year that my wife will let me play the movie Groundhog Day. And I'll just be on loop all day long. I love the movie because it, if you haven't seen it before, I, you know, find it on cable somewhere and, and watch it this year um, because it. It takes this character, Phil, who is a weatherman, and he has been assigned to go to Punxsutawney for the Groundhog Day Festival there. And, you know, the most famous weatherman in the world is a groundhog, you know. And so he's, he's there, and at the beginning of the movie, he's just so focused on self, about his career, his pleasure, his joy. Everything is just about Phil, and it is so, like, debasing for him to have to go and listen to a squirrel talk about the weather. Like, he's, just, he's just humiliated by it, doesn't want any part of it, and then he's trapped in this endless loop of the same day over and over and over until he eventually breaks free. And the thing that, that leads to him breaking free is that he changes his perspective. Instead of this day being all about him, he finally realizes that that his day should be about others. It should be that he sees, he begins to see himself in a much wider, much broader perspective of this entire community and really that represents all of humanity and that he sees himself not as the center, as the focal point, but as, as an assistant to, to the rest of the people in this community. And when he does that, his life changes. And so I think it is that way for us as well. Not that we'll ever be trapped in a series of a thousand days to live over and over again, but that we have to examine our lives and see it with the right perspective. And you might not, you and I might be like, oh man, what I would do if I could live the same thing over, you know, live the same day for like 10 days in a row, right? I'd finally be able to catch up on my, my reading or my studying. I'd be able to do all of these things. But that's not the issue. The issue isn't that we need more time. The issue is that we need to make the most of our time. We don't need a thousand chances. We get one, and we just need to make the most of every opportunity that we get. And so today we're going to begin a seven-week series on Proverbs. And the, the emphasis of Proverbs is that we live wisely, that we live wisely. This morning we're going to be opening to Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to be opening to Proverbs chapter 3. And let me give you just a brief background of Proverbs. Proverbs is, is 31 chapters. You could read one chapter every day most months. And, and it would improve your ability to look and your perspective on life. But this, this day we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 3. 29 of these chapters were written by Solomon, who identifies himself at the beginning of the book as the teacher. And he's, he's giving this advice and he sort of speaks in a a sort of fatherly way that he's trying to guide someone who lacks wisdom. And one of the things that I've found amazing, I started reading Proverbs as a a teenager. My youth pastor encouraged me to read one chapter a day. And I haven't been able to do that, you know, since I was a teenager. But I've read through the book many times. And each time I come to it, I come to it with a little bit different perspective. And 
when I was a kid, you know, we looked, talked in Sunday school this morning that there's a verse that says, uh, stepping in the middle of someone else's quarrel is like pulling on a dog's ear. And I remember as a teenager reading that and thinking, well, I don't know. I don't know if that's right, you know. It, sometimes people need my advice. People need my wisdom in there. And now at 43 years old, I read stepping into somebody else's quarrel is like pulling a dog's ear. And I say, it's going to bite you. It's going to bite you. Like, because at 43, I have enough wisdom to recognize the wisdom that's there. At, at 15, I did not. And so we come to this wisdom, we come to these teachings that Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, gives us. And the flow of it is that, that it is supposed to increase our wisdom to live out our days well. So in Proverbs chapter 3, he is speaking about trusting the Lord with your heart. And he encourages he calls us his son. He calls us to not forget the things that he has written. I, and this is what he says. He says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. The encouragement is to keep the commands, to remember the teaching. Now this, you know, it isn't, it isn't that, you know, we sometimes we recognize this, we say, that the goal of this or the end of this is that it gives us peace. And we see that people who are truly wise have peace in their lives. That for instance, they stay out of quarrels where there's, there's nothing to be gained. They you know, don't pick up the other end of every argument, of every fight. They sometimes will let people on Facebook say dumb things without correcting them, right? Like, and, it, and it adds peace and that's, that's spawned by wisdom. And there it comes a certain amount of it, you know, where we push back on this maybe to say, but couldn't God give us that, that peace without the instruction? I mean, if we're children of God, couldn't he just promise us that? Couldn't he just give us peace without us having to do anything for it, without following the commands? And the answer, you know, maybe, maybe God could arrange everything in our lives so that they would be perfect, right? That that you would never have a flat tire when you go out to, in the morning, right? God could make that happen by his supernatural power. God is so powerful, he could even make it where you could drive down 16th Street happily, right? Like God could do that. But we have to think, maybe he's teaching us something with 16th Street and flat tires and hurricanes. Maybe God is, is using all of those things together to do some good work in and through us, right? Because that is what the scripture is teaching us. What the scripture is telling us is that there are going to be storms, there are going to be problems, there's going to be potholes. There are going to be all of these things in your life. And if you will remember his teachings, if you will remember to be wise in the way that you interact with this world, that at the end of all of those things, you'll have peace. That at the end of those things, if you pursue a life of, of righteous wisdom, that out of that you'll have, you'll have joy. There will still be storms, there will still be problems, but your response to them will be peace. I think we have to see that our lives should have, that they should be, that they should be noted for having a devotion to God, but also a devotion to wisdom. And I don't think that you can separate those two things. I don't think that we as Christians, if we're going to truly follow after God, I think that we also have to see that we need to have a devotion to wisdom, to this sort of gaining of knowledge and of truth and how to accurately apply it and use it in our lives. And the reason I, I believe this so firmly is that we have seen people who have had a pursuit of wisdom apart from God, right? Right? We, we see people who have followed after, who have chased after the truth of the nature of our universe. They've chased after that sort of earthly wisdom without first submitting their heart to God. And what does it bring them? Misery. It can bring them agony. It brings them pain. It brings them emptiness. There, may, there are people who are at the top of their professions, who are standing out in their, in their field, and yet are miserable because although they have submitted their lives to pursuing earthly wisdom, they have not also pursued devotion to God. And so it often brings emptiness. And on the other hand, we can see people who have pursued a devotion to God, 
but have not simultaneously pursued after wisdom. Because to be wise of this world is to know things like, how do you treat your neighbors? How do you treat, how about this? Let's, let's go with one that's like maybe near and dear to some of you. How do you care for your dog? Do you have a dog at all? Do you have the misfortune of having a cat? Right? Whatever it may be. But just like, how about that? Just how much of our time is invested in our lives into pets? Now, does the scripture speak on keeping a pet? Not really. Not really. It speaks about dogs a couple of times and both times it's bad. Like as a dog returns to its vomit, not a really great picture of dogs right there. Unfortunately, very true. That's why you don't ever see a dog lick my mouth. Anyway, um, but like, so how then do we live with pets? Well, there's wisdom in this world about how to deal with pets. There's wisdom in this world about for instance, how much money should we spend in buying a pet? How much money should we spend in the care of that pet? How, how much do we give of our time to a pet? And we've, you've probably seen people who they have moved way past what wisdom would say is, is right. And then, <laughs> I hope I'm not starting any fights in your home right now by talking about this. I apologize if I am. But right, we see that. We see what unwise a life of living with pets can bring. So how do we do it? How do we live that way? The scripture does, alone doesn't have the answer. Devotion to God alone won't give us the answer. We have to pursue wisdom simultaneously to our devotion to God. Those two things have to be together. Because if, if you don't, if we don't, let's say that your pursuit of, you know, your pursuit of wisdom hasn't taught you what is wise and how, wise and how to treat a pet and you were to keep your dog chained up in a little bitty section in your front yard, and then you decide, I want to go tell my neighbors about the gospel. Are they going to listen? No. They're going to say, why would I listen to you about eternity when you don't even know how to take care of a dog? Something as simple as taking care of a dog you can't handle. Why should I trust my soul with anything you have to say? You have to have both. There have to, has to be a devotion to God. There has to be a devotion to wisdom. Without that devotion to wisdom, our piety grows hollow. Our righteousness will, will get empty. At the end of this, this verse, it says that, that God will give us peace. That God gives us peace. Peace I will add to you. Now, the translation that I'm using here says peace. You'll find translations that will use the word prosperity instead of peace. You'll hear, in fact, this verse is often used by preachers of a certain persuasion, certain ilk, to say that God wants you to be prosperous. And a lot of times they will use this verse as a way of saying that God wants you to be prosperous and, and wealthy. But the best, the word here is, is shalom. And I, I feel like peace is the best way to talk about it, or maybe even wholeness. That God wants you to be whole. God doesn't want you to go through life feeling as if you're missing something. He doesn't want you to feel as if you're empty or drained. He wants you to feel complete. He wants you to have shalom. He wants you to have shalom. Now that doesn't mean that God wants you to necessarily have prosperity. And the reason I think it's important that we understand this is that this idea of following God's command is not a simple sort of um, if-then sort of situation. It's not saying that if you do this, then you'll get this. Because God is not an ATM that if we just sort of put in our, our card with him and punch in the numbers that God delivers a, a certain prescribed thing. It isn't that. The emphasis, in fact, is not on the result. The emphasis is on the relationship. We don't pursue wisdom. We don't pursue godliness and wisdom just so that we can get some result for us. We pursue those things because the relationship is important to us. The next verse, Proverbs 3, 3, says this, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. This idea of it 
of this pursuit of wisdom being bound around our necks and our hearts. Solomon's not, when he talks about something being bound around his neck, he's not describing jewelry. He's not saying, if you pursue God, that God's going to just put this big fat bling around your neck. He's not going to say, you'll just be iced out, right? You're going to be surrounded in gold. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about something you'll be bound around the neck. In the, in the Hebrew anthropology, the neck represented life. It represented life. The heart was, was that love connection. So he's saying, if you pursue after God and his wisdom, that you will have a fullness to your life and love. That that's what it'll look like. That's what shalom looks like. It is having life and love and faithfulness to God, faithfulness to pursue after wisdom. It, it leads us. The emphasis, though, is on the relationship it's not about the result. The thing about getting our priorities straight is that we have to make sure that the relationship is our priority, not the result. That our priority needs to be that we will have a right relationship with the Lord. And as far as results, what that leads to is, becomes much less important. It should be much less important to us what, what God does with us. What should be important to us is that we are pursuing a relationship with him. And that's hard. That's hard because sometimes when we are in the midst of pursuing a right relationship with him, we are pursuing God's wisdom, bad things happen. Bad things happen to us. And we are left wondering why those bad things happen to us. And it, it's, it's just human nature that you're going to wonder. You're going to wonder why these things happen. Why? Why did this person I love have to die young? Why does this person that I love, why am I watching them suffer? And we sometimes say, well, where's God in this? Where is God in this? That's part of our nature, that we will wonder those things. But if we're going to have peace in spite of the pain, then our priority has to be on the relationship, not the result. It has to be on the relationship. So we know that this is God's guidance for us. We know this is God's guidance for us. His word is clear that his guidance for us is to put our priority, our focus on the relationship. That's why when Jesus picks up the same line of thought and he says, seek first the kingdom of God. To seek first that relationship with the heavenly father and then all these good things will be added to you. But it is to seek first after the relationship, the kingdom of God. This is God's desire for our relationship. So what does it look like? What does it look like when people actually do this? How do people who are seeking devotion to God and wisdom respond when they look at life? As I mentioned at the beginning, 29 chapters of Proverbs are Solomon giving instruction Chapter 30 is different. Chapter 30 isn't Solomon giving instructions. Chapter 30 is a man named Agur who is responding to instruction. Now, it, his response is full, full of wisdom on its own, but everything that you find in chapter 30 of Proverbs, you can see its origin, its sort of root back in the first 29 chapters of Proverbs. Everything that Agur says, which Agur is not a, a person who you ever hear about again in the Bible. In fact, the name Agur means collector. And so there's a certain way of understanding the Proverbs that for 29 chapters we have the teacher teaching, and then in chapter 30 we have the collector saying, I've listened, teacher. I've listened, and here are the things that I have gained from listening to your instruction for 29 chapters. And so Agur, the collector, he responds to the wisdom of Solomon. And here's what he says in chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. He says, two things I ask of you. And this is sort of a prayer that he is making. And so after being filled with wisdom in his pursuit of devotion to God, he says, two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Which is says, basically, I pray that you will give me this for as long as I'm living. First, remove far from me falsehood and lying. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. 
So he says, remove far from me falsehood and lying, which is to say he wants to do no stock and trade with deceit whatsoever. He does not want to be told falsehood, and he does not want to ever lie. He just wants to deal in the truth exclusively. That's the first thing that he wants. And the second is that he would have neither poverty nor riches. He doesn't want one extreme, nor does he want the other. He explains it by going on in that verse saying, feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of God. Now, this thing that he says here the, in, the verse, in verse 8, he says, feed me with the food that is needful for me. The word that he uses there is sometimes translated as, as bread. Sometimes translated as bread. In fact, it's most often trans, translated as bread. And he, so he's saying, give me my bread that I need. Give me my daily bread. Not bread that lasts for, you know, years. Not less than a full day's worth of bread. But give me my daily bread. This, I think, is a great example of the singular voice of Scripture. That when God speaks to and through his people, he is consistent in the way he does it. You remember back in, in the Exodus, as the children of Israel are wandering, that God gives them bread every day. Every day he gives them bread. Not extra, not too little, but just enough. Agar hears the wisdom of Solomon and he says, I don't want to be rich because I know that rich won't make me complete. I don't want to be rich because I know that that richness will not bring me shalom. It won't bring me peace. I don't want to be, be rich because I know that then I'll put my trust in myself. I'll put my trust in my money. And I won't put my trust in the Lord. So don't give me too much bread. Give me just enough. And at the same time, don't lead me into want. Don't give me too little because I know if I have too little... That knowing myself, knowing the wickedness that's in me, I'll decide that the best answer is to steal it from somebody else. And I know if I do that, then I'm not going to be a good ambassador of your people. I'm not going to be a good one to spread your word. So, so don't lead me down that pathway either. Instead, just give me enough. This is a response. This is a, a wise response to hearing wisdom. And it shows that he wants first devotion to God and second Devotion to living wisely. This, this comes at, about as a result of having the right priority. See, Agar has heard the wisdom of Solomon and his priority is a relationship with God. It's not the result. It's not to have stacks of bread. It's to have enough and just enough. And have enough to be in a right relationship with God. God. How many people do you know that their stuff has them? That their stuff has them. That they are mastered by the things that they own. A few months ago, Doug told me something that I have not forgotten. He said, he was talking, he said, the happiest day in a man's life is when he buys a boat. The second happiest day in a man's life is when he sells it. Right? Because the things that we have, they have us right back. And Agar recognizes that. Solomon makes that clear. And so when it comes to possessions, because God tells us how to be wise with possessions, that to pursue wisdom is to be careful in how we deal with our possessions. And so we put the right perspective on them. We put our perspective on the relationship. We put our perspective on the relationship and not on the result. See, because here's what I know. And again, you'll see this throughout the scripture. And that is that though we are sometimes poor, that in the midst of poverty that we feel as if we are rich. If you have the right perspective. If you feel as if you're running out of time, you look and you say, no, Jesus has redeemed the time. And so I have just enough have enough time to do what matters it's a matter of perspective I guess one last thing that I want to talk about when it comes to this perspective this issue of perspective is that when it 
when Agur talks or when Solomon talks about poverty or he talks about possessions, when we talk about being rich or being poor, what's the scale of that? What is the scale of that? One of the interesting studies, surveys that I've seen done from time to time is how much money it takes to be considered rich. How much money it takes to be considered rich. And over the years, that number has shifted a lot. It has moved dramatically upward. That there was a time in America that to say to have a million dollars meant that you were rich. And many people here this morning would be like, yep, nope, I, that's, that's still a good measure right there. A million dollars seems rich. And yet there are other people who I know who have a million dollars and they don't consider themselves rich. The standard of what it means to be rich in America has changed so much. I once spoke with a young lady whose, whose dad was a, an executive at, at Conoco several years ago. He was an executive at Conoco, and she lived in this mansion of a home in, in somewhere in Houston. And I was like, oh, so you're like, you're like loaded, like you're rich. And she's like, no, we're not rich. I mean, you know, not, not rich. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're middle class. I'm like, really? You're, you're, you're middle class? She said, yeah. Now, and then she named another young lady. She said, she's rich because like we have a maid and a gardener, but she has six people on her staff at home. I'm like you have a maid full time and you're not rich. Okay, all right, yeah, that's middle class. No, it's not. No, that's not middle class, sorry. That's not what middle class means. It's comparative. That's the issue with wealth is that wealth is comparative. Stuff is comparative. And comparison is dangerous. Comparison is so dangerous. That's why when Paul talks about his financial resources, he says that as long as we have enough to eat, as long as we have clothes and we have some place to sleep that's you know dry, we've got enough. You and I, we... When we think about our, our finances, oftentimes we think of them by, in terms of, of comparison. And oftentimes we compare them to people in our neighborhoods. When we talk about comparative wealth, we almost never go to Nigeria. Right? We, we almost, I almost never, when I'm thinking about wealth, do I think about Zimbabwe. I never want to compare my financial situation, my physical comforts to people who don't own shoes. I never do that. I always think about the people who own more shoes than I do or the people who have a bigger house or a nicer car. It's always the comparison that way. But it doesn't matter. Any sort of comparison that we do like that, it robs us. It robs us of our joy. It robs us of our peace. Here's one. Just this morning I was having a conversation with somebody who has some things going on that they're upset about. And he said, you know, I don't know why I'm complaining. I talked to somebody the other day who has cancer. You know, I don't have cancer. And what they're trying to do right there is they're trying to not feel so bad about their situation. And that's admirable. It's really, it's laudable. Because, and I find myself in that situation where I'm like, oh, poor me, poor me, my feet hurt. Poor me, I'm getting old, poor me. People I love are dying, poor me. I get there. And let me just tell you that it's really dangerous when you find yourself there to say, well, at least I'm not so-and-so. At least I'm not so-and-so. What's really great is in the New Testament, Jesus does this exact thing. Like he sees a man who says, thank God I'm not like him. And Jesus blasts that guy who says, at least I'm not like him. Because that, doing that to look at your situation and compare it to somebody else's, it's toxic. It's still comparison. It's still going to rob you of your joy. It's still going to rob you of your peace. It is still putting your priority of thought on the result, not the relationship. Now, what does it look like when we put our priority on the relationship instead of the result? When we put our priority on the relationship instead of the result, we look at our life and we say, yeah, I'm being transferred from one job to a different job. And God's going to use me in the new job too. Now, when we look at the result, we say, oh, the hours aren't as good. The pay's, oh, you know, maybe a little better, but the hours are awful. And I'm not going to be able to work with these people that I really like. 
That's comparative thinking. That's thinking about the result. It's not thinking about the relationship that's primary. When we consider our primary relationship first, then when we are transferred in work or when we are in a fight, when we have a quarrel in our family, when we have a di medical diagnosis that is hard, then we look at the relationship and we say, all right, God is God, God is sovereign, God is in control, God knows that I am here. And so he will either deliver me from this or he will use me in the midst of this. One way or another, right? Now, what does that do to God? What does that do for our connection to him? Well, it allows God to be God and to move in the way that God wants to move, to use us in the way God wants to use us without, without the ramifications that we're going to try and judge him. Because when we sit there and we say, oh, poor me, oh, poor me, that is us sitting in judgment of what God has done. That is us sitting in judgment of the way that God is making things in, in life work out. But when we put our priority on the relationship, it changes all of that. When we put the priority on the relationship, we say, God, use me how you want to use me. We say, we say God, teach me to number my days rightly. Teach me how to make the most of these, this time that you have given me. Even if it's, even if it's incredibly short. Even if, even if today is my last day on earth, let me use it for you and not for me. Let me use this day to pursue what you want done in your world instead of making me rich, instead of making me well off, instead of making me healthy, instead of making me anything. That's the difference in, in priority living. My hope and prayer for us this year is that, and I see this here, in that I see plenty of people here who have the right priorities, that they're like, God's opening doors, let's take it. God's doing this, let's get involved. Let's move in at the impulse of God's love to go where he wants us to go and do what he wants us to, to do and be who he wants us to be. I see that here. And yet I know that, that there is this temptation, that it's, it is there for us to say, let's put our priority on the result instead of the relationship. So let's do that this year. Let's consider the relationship first and let the results be whatever God decides they're going to be. But let our focus be on a devotion to God and a devotion to wisdom to say, we will pursue after you first. We will pursue after you first and let him take care of the rest. Let's pray together. Our most gracious Father, we thank you for today. Lord, and we thank you that That we are in the midst of a relationship with you and that this relationship that we have with you that it bears no comparison that there is no relationship that comes close to it and that the relationship that each of us have with you individually that it isn't open to comparison Lord I pray that you would inspire us to be devoted that you would inspire us to be wise that you would that you would make us wise and that you would help our hearts that you would hang it around our hearts and necks, that, that our life and love would be about the pursuit of a relationship with you. Let us not find ourselves as those who live so self-centeredly, but that we would give ourselves to you completely. Lord, help us to have a relationship priority as we move into this year. We pray that you would make us wise. Lord, I pray this morning that if there's any here today that, that doesn't know you in that sort of relationship, that, that their knowledge of you may be very incomplete. Maybe they've got the knowledge and they've just never pursued a relationship with you. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would move in their heart today. There's, that your spirit would move in their heart today, that today they would say, this is it. This is the day I, I change things. I devote myself not to just knowledge, not just to a job or a collection of wealth, but that I devote myself to God. 
that I know a Savior who died for me so I might live for him. But if there's any here that doesn't know you today, I pray that salvation would come to them today. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We will have a time of, of invitation now as, as our instrumentalists play and we sing. If there's a response that you need to make this morning, we will be here. Stand with me as you're able.